In this video, we are going to be talking about weight management. Here's some food for thought for you that you can reflect about right now or maybe talk to someone about if there's someone nearby. But does a healthy body weight actually indicate good health? Hmm, let's talk about it. All right, so I guess the overall question we need to ask first is what is a healthy weight? There's a few ways that we can determine um, weight, one of those being, um, or healthy weight, I should say, one of those being body mass index or BMI. I think most of us are familiar with that term by now. With BMI, what we're doing is we're taking our weight in kilograms and we're dividing that by our height in meters squared. And basically, based on that proportion, we're able to see. Um, distribution-wise, whether you're within a healthy range or not. Now, that kilograms divided by meters squared, you can do that by pencil and paper. However, it's really easy to just type into um, Google BMI calculator and put in your numbers, and then they'll generate that BMI for you. All right, so we have BMI. And BMI is used in a lot of different settings, such as in our hospital settings, generally when they take your weight and height. Um, you'll see either in your chart or maybe on your app that's associated with um, the doctor's office or the hospital that you go to, what your BMI is. But is BMI actually a reliable measurement? All right, well, let's take a look at an example. So this is Khalil Mack. He is a Bears linebacker. Thank you to my husband for this example. Um, he is six foot three and he weighs 247 pounds. Now, if we were to plug in his height and his weight into a BMI calculator, what we would find, so let's go back to our BMI index here. So what we would find is that his BMI is 43.4. Now, if we were to track this, I forgot to mention, um, so normal range is 18.5 to 25. Um, 25 to 30, that's saying that you're overweight. 30 plus, you are, um, it's indicated as obese, and then there's categories even after that. So Khalil Max BMI, once we put in the, um, the height and the weight, is going to be 43.4. So that's going to place him well above this obese category. However, Khalil Mack is a um, athlete. We can see that um, he has a large muscle density. Um, so he has much more muscle than fat. So how can we account for that? How is BMI saying that he is obese when clearly if we look at him, he's not an obese person? Well, um, muscle mass weighs more than fat mass does. That's why BMI is not the best measure. We can have a healthy person, um, even athletes, who have a high, higher proportion of this muscle mass, which is going to weigh more, which then skews their body weight to make it seem like they're not a healthy person, they're a high body weight, but it's of muscle, it's not of fat, which is healthier. Um, that's why BMI, again, it's a good measure for approximations and to just get a baseline value, but it's not going to be appropriate for certain people. These are some other ways that we can measure body composition, which I just realized my head is blocking the screen. So let's move that. There we go. All right. Uh, one of those is hydrostatic weighing. So the idea being that lean tissue, such as muscle and bone, that's going to weigh more underwater. So in other words, someone with a um, higher muscle mass is going to sink lower in the water, as opposed to someone that has more fat tissue, which is less dense in water, they're going to flow closer to the surface. So that's one way that we can measure body composition. Another way is through skin fold thickness measurements. Um, with these, they're just going to be taking a caliber. This is a um, 
common practice that you'll see in gyms, for instance, if you have a personal trainer, they're going to use these skin fold measurements and um, they're able to determine by the folds, the measurements, how much fat is underneath the skin. Then we also have um, DEXA scans. So this down here, um, it's an x-ray that's able to break down the composition of the body. So it's able to differentiate between lean muscle mass, bone, fat, um, and it's able to give those uh, more precise percentages as far as what your own body is composed of. And then finally, we have the um, BIA, the um, bioelectrical impedance analysis. And what this is going to do is it's going to send electrical currents through the body. And with this, the body fat is going to create more resistance. So in other words, it's going to take longer for that electrical impulse to travel through the body compared to if a person has more muscle mass, which is going to travel more quickly. That electrical impulse will travel more quickly through the body. Now, when it comes to these four measurements, this DEXA scan is going to be the most accurate. Um, however, with accuracy comes expense. Generally, well, I don't think I've seen any gym that has a, a DEXA scan available to its patrons. However, we're going to see these DEXA scans in hospital settings and also university settings. So again, this, is, this DEXA scan is going to be the gold standard when it comes to measuring body composition, but it is the most expensive. Hydrostatic weighing is similar in that we're primarily just going to see this in university settings, whereas um, BIA and skin fold measurements, these are going to be more accessible and available to the everyday common person that is not in a university setting and hopefully is not in the hospital either. These are figures as far as what our body composition should look at as far as the percentage of fat is concerned. There we go. Um, so we can see here that obviously we need some body fat for our body in order for us to thrive. Um, women require more body fat than men do. So as we can see, a body fat percentage of just 12% for women, that's going to be too lean, whereas for men, that's much lower. 4% is going to be that too lean category. And then we can see these um, figures increase with lean, moderate, and then um, what they term in this figure, over fat or overweight. There's two different types of body fat that we should be aware of, those being visceral fat and subcutaneous fat. Subcutaneous fat, this is the fat that we more commonly associate with body fat. It's the fat that if we look in the mirror and we say, ooh, I could probably use it, um, lose a few pounds, we're talking about our subcutaneous fat. That's more of our surface fat. Whereas the visceral fat, the visceral fat's the type that we don't actually notice. It's fat that's going to be surrounding our body organs. And this type of fat, this visceral fat, is actually the more concerning type of fat compared to the subcutaneous fat. Because the visceral fat is housed or close to these organs. And because of that, the communication of these organs is going to be impaired and it's going to impair their functionality which is then going to create problems when it comes to things such as glucose control which we actually talked about this in the diabetes lecture um, which i believe was last week so if you don't know what i'm talking about go back to last week's video the diabetes video we talk about that more then now you've probably heard of the android and gynoid body shapes. Um, with these, with an android body shape, which is more of an apple shape, um, with this, it said that there's going to be higher, although when we're talking about these body shapes, we're more so talking about subcutaneous fat. However, with this body distribution, they also say that with an apple shape, these people are more prone to have higher levels of that visceral fat, so that fat that's um, health damaging, 
Whereas a gynoid body shape, so that's more of the pear body shape, with these body shapes are going to have, or people with these body shapes are going to have higher proportions of subcutaneous fat um, as opposed to visceral fat, which again, subcutaneous fat, we're not as concerned with as visceral fat. Now our body shape can also tell us about our health. Naturally, we all have different body shapes. However, for some of us, that's going to mean some things. Um, with mesomorphs, those are going to be people that easily lose or gain weight. They can do either with ease. Ectomesomorphs, or I'm sorry, ectomorphs, these are going to be individuals that are generally more um, lean, and it's going to be much more difficult for them to gain weight. So they might be accused of being too skinny, um, and it might be significantly more difficult for them to try to gain more weight. Whereas on the opposite end of the uh, spectrum here with endomorphs, this is the opposite of an ectomorph. In other words, um, genetically, naturally, they um, have more um, of a shape. They aren't necessarily lean and trim, um, but they're a little more, I guess we can call it shapely. Um, and for them, it's going to be a little more difficult to lose weight. So not to say for the ectomorph or the endomorph that um, in the case of the ectomorph, weight gain isn't possible, and for endomorph, weight loss is not possible. However, with those body shapes, it's just going to be more difficult for the person to either lose or gain weight. And obviously, this all falls upon a spectrum, so not everyone is strictly going to be classified as an ectomorph or an endomorph. Uh, they might fall somewhere in between here. All right, so next let's talk about calorie balance. Now, before we talk about this, I do want to say that, yes, when it comes to energy balance, it, the, it is a lot of calories in versus calories out. However, we also need to keep in mind the nutrients that we're consuming as well. Because as we've been learning throughout this class, Certain nutrients are going to be health beneficial and other nutrients are going to be health detrimental. So just keep that in mind as I'm going through this particular slide. For a balanced weight, um, it's going to look like calories in versus calories out. So in other words, our calories that we eat are then matched by the calories that we burn. We can say though, so that's a balanced weight, we can say though that malnutrition, which we talked about malnutrition earlier in this course, we can say that malnutrition involves either not getting enough food or nutrients, or you're eating enough food or too much food even, but it's not nutrient dense food and you're not getting those pop, um, proper nutrients that you need. Either of those, um, so in this case, we're talking about disordered eating and overweight and obesity. Those are going to be imbalances when it comes to our um, caloric intake. So for the disordered eating, the calories eaten is going to be low, whereas the calories burned is going to be extremely high. Whereas the opposite then is true for, the, uh, for overweight and obesity, where the calories eaten is much larger when compared to the calories burned. All right, so speaking of malnutrition, we are going to talk about um, obesity briefly. So this is a chronic energy imbalance. So, I mean, based on that last figure, we can say that when it comes to obesity, um, generally there's um, a lot of calories being taken in, but not a lot of calories being expended. Um, with BMI, as, or um, with obesity, I should say, as we saw with BMI, this is going to be classified as a BMI of 30 or higher. This is influenced by multiple factors. We can take a look at uh, diet, which I think that's what we normally think of when it comes to obesity, is eating too much food and not eating the right foods. However, we can also take a look at genetics. So um, going back, generally um, obesity is going to be more common in a person with an endomorph um, body type as opposed to an ectomorph 
or mesomorph body type. And then also physical and inactivity is going to play a role as well. Because again, when it comes to those calories burned, we'll see a little bit later that this in part is due to physical activity. Now with obesity, this is going to increase our risk when it comes to certain diseases, which we'll take a look at that in um, a second. Um, again, here's some factors that contribute to overweight and obesity. We're going to talk about environmental factors in a different video. Um, so take a look out for the obesogenic environment video, which we'll talk about um, environmental factors more then. However, today's video, we're going to more so be focusing on this dietary intake and calorie um, sources. We'll also be talking about metabolic rate as well. Know too that genetic influences play a role. Um, so we actually talked about in the diabetes video that if a mother has um, gestational diabetes, that's going to actually increase the chances of her infant then developing diabetes later on. This isn't to say that all women who have gestational diabetes um, will have children that have diabetes later on. That's not what I'm saying. But it's going to increase your chances or your, or your risk of that happening. And then our hormones can also play a role when it comes to our body weight. Um, so for instance, with polycystic ovarian syndrome, um, this causes hormonal imbalances that result in a higher um, body weight. And also our um, hormones um, can also influence our appetite, um, our metabolism, and also our body fat distribution. So hormones can actually play quite a significant role when it comes to our um, body fat and our body weight distribution. Here's a list of um, things that obesity are related to. So obesity is correlated with many different health concerns being um, things such as type 2 diabetes, heart disease, certain types of cancer, mental illness, which honestly mental illness, you can flip that one way or another, mental illness can um, lead to overweight and obesity, but also the overweight and obesity can lead to mental illness. So again, we can see that going either way. Um, sleep apnea, so um, sleep can be affected by um, increased body weight. Um, again, as we can see, obesity is related to a lot of different health problems and concerns. Eating disorders. So we've looked at malnutrition as far as obesity is concerned. Now we're going to take a look at the opposite end of not getting in enough calories. There's two main types of eating disorders. The first of those being anorexia nervosa. Um, this is restricting eating so that weight falls um, more than 15% below what's considered normal. And with anorexia nervosa, there's this fear of becoming um, fat, um, either when they're at a normal body weight or maybe they're below a normal body weight. So in other words, how they perceive themselves, how they look is different than how they actually look. Um, with women with anorexia nervosa, this can also be men who have it. It's not just women. However, it's more prevalent in women. Um, anorexia can be um, confirmed, I guess you can say, when a woman, uh, woman um, doesn't have three menstrual cycles in a row. Bulimia nervosa, on the other hand, this one isn't necessarily calorie restriction. On the other um, hand, though, this has to do more so with um, binge eating, so um, episodes of in taking a lot of food at once, and then um, losing control during eating, and then um, regular um, inducing like vomit-wise, um, or using laxatives or diuretics in order to prevent weight gain after those binges. Um, this can often be seen with strict dieting and fasting. Um, and also there might be an overemphasis on exercise, which we can also say with anorexia as well. Both of these, anorexia and um, bulimia, there's going to be a concern or an over-concern when it comes to body image. 
And so that's why it's important to address what's causing those um, body issue or body image issues or concerns. All right, so we've talked about some things that play a role when it comes to our body weight or understanding our body weight, but you're probably wondering, well, how do I actually then go about managing my weight? So again, talking about calories, um, when it comes to our calorie needs, these are going to be dependent upon a few things. One being how old we are. So as we age, um, especially once we're adults and then we move into later life, we're going to need to decrease our calorie needs. Whereas calorie needs when we're younger are much higher because our metabolisms are working more quickly, um, we're growing, and so we need more of those calories. We need more nutrients in order to um, help aid those processes. Our biological sex is going to determine our calorie needs. So men require more calories in general than women do. Our height and our weight will also determine our calorie needs and also our physical activity. So the more that you engage in physical activity, the more calories then you'll need in order to compensate for that lost energy. You can actually determine the amount of energy or calories that you need by using this estimated energy requirements calculation. Note the word estimated in this. This isn't saying that this is exactly what you need calorie wise. And again, our calories are going to be dependent on um, certain factors. But this does take into account things such as our age, because that's going to um, determine our calorie needs. And also this um, looks at our physical activity levels. So we're able to incorporate what our physical activity is into this figure in order to determine what our estimated needs are. Just so you know, um, this is going to need you to calculate your weight into kilograms. In order to do that, you can just uh, take your weight in pounds and uh, multiply that by 2.2. And then to convert your um, height from feet to meters, you'll take your height and you'll divide that by 3.3. All right, um, so when it comes to our daily energy expenditure, so when we're talking about energy expenditure, that means how much our body is using energy throughout the day, so how much we're burning, essentially. There's three different factors that play a role when it comes to this, um, one being our basal metabolic rate. So these are the processes that occur when our body's at rest, because although we might not be moving, our body through metabolic processes are still utilizing energy in order for those processes to happen. Um, so most, we can say more than half, 60% approximately of our actual energy expenditure is coming from processes that we're not even physically aware of or mentally, I should say, aware of. Another con uh, contributor to our daily energy expenditure is gonna be through physical um, activity. Um, so about 32% of our daily energy expenditure comes from physical activity. However, keep in mind that our um, exercise intensity matters. Intensity meaning how hard or how much effort we're putting in when it comes to our exercise. So activities such as running, swimming, um, tennis, those are going to be higher intensity activities whereas um, just casual walking, for instance, that would be lower intensity. And then finally, the thermic effect of our foods. Um, so this is essentially talking about when it comes to our bodies digesting nutrients, this is going to be the thermic effect, so that energy that it takes from breaking down those nutrients. Um, these are some factors that can influence our energy intake and expenditure. So things such as our physiology, which we already took a look at our body distribution and how that plays a role. Um, so people that have a um, 
higher muscle mass, their bodies are going to metabolize nutrients more quickly. So they're going to have higher metabolisms. Whereas um, less lean body mass, that's going to mean that a person, it's going to take longer for them to metabolize nutrients. Um, genetics also plays a role. And then psychological, behavioral, and social influences. Um, so that could relate to things such as your work environment and stress. Do you stress eat? Um, social environment, how you engage in social activities. Are you going out to a bar or are you going for a hike? Those can indicate um, what your intake and energy expenditure looks like. For some people, this is occasional. Um, as far as these influences here, it's more situational. For other people, it's more chronic. All right, so now let's finally talk about some considerations for weight loss. Um, I understand this isn't going to apply to everyone in the class, but for some of you, this might be something that you are um, interested in hearing a little bit more about. We've talked a lot of, in this class about the fact that we need to have a certain amount of nutrients in our diet. We also need to focus on the quality of those nutrients. Again, it's not just calories in, calories out, but it's also what types of nutrients are we consuming and are those beneficial to our health or not so much. So we wanna make sure that we're eating more um, fiber, so that includes things such as um, vegetables, fruit, although fruit for someone, for instance, with diabetes, they need to limit. Um, whereas we need to eat less of um, total fat, saturated fat, refined grains, and um, added sugars. Here's some questions that we can ask ourselves as far as weight management and um, what you want your goals to look like or what your current habits look like. Um, this is just something that I personally developed. So you can walk through this list and ask yourself these different questions in order to identify what it is you're wanting to change, why you're wanting to change, because sometimes the why is even more important than the what, and then how you're going to go about with that change. Now this I'm not really going to talk about just because we're currently doing it in our class through our dietary analysis assignments, but there's multiple different tools that we can use in order to assess our current progress um, when it comes to making nutritional changes. Again, not going to talk about this just because you're currently doing it. Um, okay. Tips for successful weight loss. There are um, many things that we need to consider when it comes to weight loss. First, we wanna make sure we're talking to our doctor um, so that they are aware of the changes that we're wanting to make and they might, so, uh, might also have some suggestions for you as well. Another um, thing that's important is to aim to lose one pound per week. Now this is going to be more for someone that's um, newly starting off on their weight loss journey because we're going to be losing more water weight. However, with time, normal weight loss is going to look like one pound per week. Um, this is going to include a deficit of about 500 calories per day in order to promote weight loss. Um, let's see. I'm going to skip down to here. Focus on small gradual steps. This is going to be important because if we um, create lofty goals, for ourselves, then this is going to be harder for us to attain. And if we don't attain these lofty goals that we keep for ourselves, then we're more likely to quit. However, if we create smaller goals for ourselves, then we can create more achievable successes and we can build upon those successes as we go. Another thing is to avoid restricting yourself. Um, Obviously, I just said that we do need to cut back on our calories a little. However, we shouldn't hate the process that we're going through. Um, we should try to find foods that we enjoy and that we like to eat and to not deprive ourselves either. So give yourselves one little, um, they call them cheat, right? A cheat day, maybe not a cheat day because that could really throw you off, but maybe just a cheat snack or a cheat dessert at the end of the week to congratulate yourself. Um, another thing is to don't get discouraged. Uh, 
weight loss is going to be a very long process. I've gone through it personally. It takes some time. It's not going to happen overnight. Um, so if we get discouraged, then we're, again, more likely going to um, quit. However, if we focus on our long-term goals, then we can slowly work our way towards that. And we can look back on our progress as we go and see how much we've changed over time, not just physically, but also emotionally and mentally as well, because our emotional and mental health does tie in closely when it comes to our um, overall physical health. Um, the buddy system, this is going to be helpful. So in other words, have someone that you can be doing this with or someone that you can be accountable to. Um, so you can create competitions with one another in order to encourage each other. You can meet up to go on walks together, have healthy recipe exchanges. So involving other people that can be uh, motivating and helpful when it comes to weight loss. Eat breakfast. Um, in America, a lot of us are bad when it comes to eating breakfast. However, um, with breakfast, so we go to bed at night and our bodies, um, we haven't consumed anything for long periods of time. And so because of that, our metabolisms are going to be more revved up, or in other words, um, they're going to burn nutrients more quickly. So that's why breakfast then becomes important. We're able to replenish ourselves from a night of not eating. And our body then is going to take those foods and they're going to burn them more quickly. You'll also find with eating breakfast that this is going to give us more energy throughout the day. One thing that I learned when I was in my nutrition studies was that breakfast should be like the king. It should be your biggest, most important meal of the day. Lunch is the queen, so it's like the medium-sized meal. And then the joker, he's going to be our dinner. So he's going to, or I guess you could say the, what did you call them? Um, I guess you could say the prince too. That might be a better analogy. So the king, the queen, and then the prince. So the prince has the least role when it comes to the royal family. And it should have the least role when it comes to um, our food habits or our daily expenditures or daily intake, I should say, not expenditures. Um, okay, and then finally developing SMART goals. If you took HED 120, you should be very familiar with SMART goals, especially if you were in my section because we have a whole project on SMART goals. But essentially, it helps to create goals for ourselves and it's important to set parameters to our goals. So to make them very well-defined and clear, make them specific, um, to put specific measures, so numbers that we can reach as we're creating these goals, making sure our goals are healthy and realistic. So we're not going to say we're going to lose 30 pounds in one week. Um, that's not realistic and that's going to be very discouraging when you get to the end of the week and you haven't lost those 30 pounds. So again, things that are realistic and things that are healthy that they're not going to um, be a detriment to your health. Also, it's important to make sure that these goals are important to you. And then finally, to also set benchmarks for yourself as well. That kind of goes along with measurable, but essentially saying how long are you going to be doing these goals for um, or having um, check-in points, if you would, for these certain goals. Here's some examples of what SMART goals will look like. Again, I'm not really going to go into this because the HED 120 class covers it, but these are some examples of um, different goals that you can create your, for yourself, um, whether it be for exercise, we also do one for mental health, and then for nutrition as well. If you have any questions when it comes to things such as weight loss or um, calories in, calories out, eating disorders, et cetera, feel free to reach out to me. I would be happy to talk to you more on an individual level about those things.